Hello, and welcome to this virtual pop-up studio hosted by Healthcare Now Radio and Health Innovation Media. I'm Dr. Nick Van Hayden, host of The Incrementalist, which airs on Healthcare Now Radio. And I'm talking today with three industry leaders from Medicomp Systems, who are here to share their thoughts and insights about the emergence of artificial intelligence, natural language processing and machine learning as a major technology buzz for 2020, and how poor electronic health care medical record usability design has contributed to this clinician burnout that we keep on hearing about, and the critical role nurses play in health IT decisions and what we can do about it with technology and innovation. Here with me from Medicomp Systems is Dave LaRoe, he's the Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Jay Anders, the Chief Medical Officer, and Tony Laraquente, the company's Chief Nursing Officer. For the benefit of the listeners, can I ask you all to introduce yourselves and provide a little bit of background about you. Dave, could we start with you? Sure, uh, I'm Dave LaRoe, uh, CEO of Medicomp Systems. I've been with Medicomp since 1995. Prior to that, I was in the billing industry and uh, had a customer who was very interested in electronic medical records in 1990. I discovered Medicomp and uh, ditched the billing company, and I've been here ever since. Thanks, Dave. Jay, how about you? Well, I joined Medicomp about six years ago. Um, been through several companies, but for before that, I was 19 years in a large multi-specialty group practice as a general internist and got interested in healthcare IT. One thing led to another, and many companies sold back and forth. I wind up here at Medicomp with my dream job. Fantastic. And last but not least, Tony? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Nick. Yes. Um, well, I am uh, the new kid on the block for Medicomp. I've been with the company now for almost five months after um, a fairly extensive uh, history in healthcare clinical IT. Uh, but I started my nursing career out in critical care and emergency department uh, and uh, trauma ED and uh, then moved into uh, quality and safety. And that uh, led me to think that things have to be done uh, more efficiently. There's got to be a better way. And that sparked my interest in healthcare IT. And here I am almost 20 years later and here with Medicomp. I'm also in my dream job, so I feel very lucky. Fantastic. So I think we're all sort of united in this desire to change the existing system. I think technology has uh, the potential to do it. Dave, I know you've been at this for a long time. You and I have known each other for a long time. This whole concept of natural language processing, and now people are sort of talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, and you've been in this space for a long time. What is it that you're doing and what's so special and what's that going to do for us in 2020? Uh, you're right. I've, I've been at this a long time and I've been hearing that natural language processing will actually turn uh, text into data within three years for about 20 years now. And <laughs> Uh, it's it's going to take three years, right? <laughs> it's going to take another three years. We'll have it. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> well, the, the challenge is always to really use artificial intelligence uh, effectively. You have to start and end with good clinical data. Uh, the over-reliance, I think, on the hope for NLP has held us back. Meanwhile, the systems have evolved to treat transactions as data, CPT codes, ICD-10 codes, ICD-9 codes, uh, to some extent, you know, RX norm codes, LOINC codes. There, there is some clean data in these systems, but the bulk of the clinical notes in the United States, somewhere between 60 and 80 percent, depending on who you ask, is text, is dictated, transcribed, uh, typed, etc. cetera. Uh, NLP has promised to turn that into information, but that information needs to be clean data. We've been working with a company called Intelligent uh, out of Vancouver, British Columbia, who has agreed to target their NLP at our data elements, which are tied into a clinical data relevancy engine. We've been really successful at giving problem-oriented views in our early prototypes of being able to pick a diagnosis in a text document and highlighting the items in that text that are relevant for that diagnosis, which most systems out there cannot do yet. So the, the marriage of NLP to data and a relevancy engine that can help filter it, we think, and Jay will talk a little bit about this in his segment, we think can actually improve the usability of these systems by giving you good filtered clinical views of information 
even if they're stored as text. Yeah, so that, I, it brings up a really important point. We're sort of awash with all of this data, as they call it, but we can't get to the knowledge or the insights, and that's where you're sort of starting to bring that. Jay, if you wouldn't mind, share a little bit about your thoughts around this. I know, you know, front and center today is the sort of concern around burnout. I think it's just gotten worse over time. I don't see uh, any sort of major improvements. And this sounds like a real opportunity to start to deliver useful insights to clinicians without overwhelming them. Well, yeah, interesting that I, today's point, we've got systems today that have loaded with data. We don't need more data. We've got the data. Right. We just have to get to the data. And one of the ways that we've approached that is if I'm taking care of, say, a diabetic, then I want to know the diabetic information in that chart for this particular patient while I have them in front of me, as opposed to the way they're constructed today, which there's a medication list, there's a problem list, there's a list of notes, there's a list of lab test results, there's a list of everything in that chart, but none of it is clinically relevant together. Right. So try to find the diabetic content and what I mean by that is not just diabetes, but all of its sequelae, our engine kind of put, tries to put that together. And I think the relevancy part of that is where you could take data basically from any source, put it together, and say, give me a picture of this patient's whatever, chronic renal failure, diabetes, hypertension. So, I, you know, that's the one, one part of the clinical story, but, I, it, you know, as a physician, you and I both know that sort of for so long we've missed the nursing aspect of this in the, you know, all this contribution that we were capturing but weren't actually incorporating, wasn't being used in a, a, a form that all of the team could actually process. I, I'm, I'm expecting that that's part of your sort of position around this, Tony, is that we can bring all of this together. Tell us a little bit about how that works and, and what you've seen uh, today. Okay, uh, Nick, thank you. Um, the way I... I see it is that, as as Jay said, we have an enormous amount of data, and in EHRs, at least that that I have experienced in my career um, to date, it's quite disparate. It's in silos. Um, one system in one particular care environment will not speak to another system in a different care environment, and as we know, the the patient journey needs to be accompanied by the appropriate information that people in, in those different care settings need to take care of the patient efficiently and uh, with the highest possible quality. And I think that these systems now that we have the um, we have the data, but if we can organize it in an accessible and user friendly uh, and and useful way, then that is quite possibly one of the greatest opportunities that we'll ever have in moving healthcare forward towards that, that uh, uh, the triple aim of faster, better and cheaper um, delivery of care. So nurses certainly do play an integral role in that. Uh, we're always right there beside the patient advocating for them and advocating for our peers in the development of these systems is something that I feel very strongly about. Nurses and nurse leaders are the the best resources for what nurses need and uh, for advocating for our peers and for our patients when it comes to building these systems. So given, you know, we're awash with all of this data, Dave, I know, you know, for, for the extent of time that we've been sort of talking about NLP and it's been, you know, two years away for the last 10 years, and but I, I think we are closer and we're closer for a number of reasons. Can, can you share a little bit of about why? I, I, I mean, I certainly feel we're at this inflection point, and I know you at Medicom certainly do. What is it that's changed? How is it that we're getting there and we can start to provide that knowledge that Tony and Jay are talking about? Well, there's, there's starting to be agreement. First of all, there's starting to be agreement that information needs to be shared. Information needs to be transferable. Information Shocking, needs that's to be requirement, requirement, right? <laughs> There, there is starting to be agreement that that is going to happen and that it should happen. Right. Uh, we're, start, we're starting to crack open as an industry, and uh, part of it's the government's forcing this, and now they've empowered the patients uh, with the new legislation and rulings that have passed. 
they've said to the patients, you have a right to your data, you have a right to take it with you, and you have a right to take it somewhere else. So it's up to the industry to make it transferable and understandable when the recipient receives the data, whether it's from the originating institution or possibly from the patient. So right. uh, the agreement is that these charts, I mean, if you go back about 15 years, when physicians in private practice referred to charts, they said, my charts. They weren't the patient's charts, then they were the charts. And now the transition is happening, so they're the patient's chart, they're the patient's data. That's going to put tremendous pressure on everybody to make certain that those charts are available. We've been talking about data, but charts right now are really stuff. Some of it is you know, codes, some of it is text, but it's all, as Jay mentioned, it's sort of, and Tony did, it's all in silos, it's everywhere. There's starting to be pressure to take even the text and turn it into something that's transferable and that you can identify the relevant stuff without having to read the whole chart because nobody has time to do that. So it's it's making the, it's increasing the investment among many companies, you know, Nuance is doing it. Uh, Health Language is doing it. Uh, IBM Watson's doing it. Everybody's getting into this game. That's going to increase competition, increase pressure on people to make it work, and increase pressure on people to make it understandable, findable, and transferable as data, not as stuff. So I'm very encouraged by the industry's attention to this and the moves that have been made recently to say, not only does it seem inevitable, but now it is inevitable. Right, so we've liberated the data. I think there's you know, a, a, a real sort of, almost a flip to a position that this is now available. And you know, Dave, you mentioned this, Jay, Tony, I imagine you're sort of concurrent with this. There's so much in what we call freeform narrative text, but isn't that where the value is? Isn't that where you found it? That's where you put it. I know that's where I invested my time in terms of describing. And this is a, a method to extract that. Jay, what's been your experience? Well, you're absolutely right. I calculated the other day on an average, I probably in my career have done 120,000 dictations over the years. That's a lot of words. And that's a lot of information. And that that's the issue. And going through uh, either a natural language processing or some type of way of extracting that will only make this better. And the better that gets, the better the data gets, and the better information I can get as a physician. So I think it's, it's very important. It's a, nice, it's a nice segue into making NLP actually usable, but it all boils down, again, to the information you get out of it. And I've spent a lot of time over a lot of years looking through a lot of paper charts and electronic charts and everything else trying to glean what I need to know. And to Tony's point, I was one of the few physicians that actually read nurses' notes because I thought they were important, especially in my hospital practice. So when I would take care of the ICU, I couldn't get along without the nurses because they had all the information I needed, but they, they don't have a good way of Every sharing Every medical it. student worth his salt knows that the first place to go is to the nurses because they always know more. They know what's going on. Absolutely. So, you, you, you have to be sort of excited about that because one of the things that was really apparent to me a long time ago was that we had all of that information, we understood that, but we weren't incorporating that in the healthcare technology space. And here's an opportunity to do that, right? Yes, that's exactly right, Nick. Um, for many years and in my, in my early days of experience working in, in clinical IT, nurses were somewhat overlooked uh, in the both from the early decision making process uh, to acquire systems and invest in these systems and then throughout the configuration and build phases and then the go lives and sometimes that you'd get into a project and we'd say you know where where is your nursing leadership in this and the nurses were as I said a complete afterthought and when we think about the fact that nurses are 40% of the healthcare workforce. And both in their collective numbers and their ability to influence outcomes in patient care, nurses are there as a resource and a critical success factor in these projects. So we, we definitely want to be engaging nurses and nursing leadership 
right from the very early stages of any EHR uh, and information systems project. Um, they are the subject matter experts in what nurses need and also um, how nurses will use that information, but also where that information needs to go. Who does it need to be communicated to and all of the different touch points? And that really stems from the, the core nursing process, which does indeed touch every part of healthcare and patient care delivery, whether it's pharmacy, laboratory, working with the physicians or community health and skilled nursing facilities and, and those kinds of care environments. So the nurse is the, is the, the person sitting in the middle communicating with all of these people. And, and when we, we move to automated or online processes and that nursing workflow is either less than optimal or ignored altogether, that's a massive hole in your system, but it's also even worse, uh, an opportunity for errors and uh, potentially in worst case scenario, patient harm to occur. So I'm very much for uh, promoting nurses to be involved right from the beginning and consistently right through these projects and on a long-term ongoing basis. I, I think the other thing I would add to that is not only are they sort of front and center and coordinating, but I, and intuitively, I don't know if this is true, but I would say that nurses spend the most time with patients out of all of the clinical team. Yes. They yes. have the most face-to-face -face time. So if we're not capturing and incorporating that, we're missing this huge opportunity for knowledge and insight and also the transmission of that knowledge to those individuals. That's exactly right. We are there face-to-face, hands-on with the patients for the majority of the patient stay in the hospital. So. There's, there's always nuances that come with being face to face with a person rather than just reading a, right. an electronic or a paper chart. So that's where we can really deliver benefit. So Jay, as, as you sort of think about the opportunities and you know, we talked a little bit about clinician burnout, you know, one of that's driven by this overload of information, the challenge of sort of dealing with this. How do you think that this is gonna shape out as we start to deliver this? Have you got some sort of vision of the way that this, the, these solutions are gonna help relieve some of that pressure and start to deliver useful knowledge and insights? Well, interestingly, I think EHRs, when they first were developed, were developed as a, a system to do transactions, just like Dave said. It's You make a note, you put in a bill, you get a this, you get a that, and it all comes together somehow. By doing some of the things we're talking about, we're going to convert the EHR into a useful tool like a stethoscope or a CT scanner, something mm. you rely on to give you what you need to actually practice medicine. No, I, I didn't go to medical school to write notes. That wasn't my goal, but I treat patients. So give me the information I need when I've got that patient in front of me to actually do that kind of work and make it augment my own abilities. And that's the, the problem with a lot of what I see. There's, they started out with things like info buttons, where you'd have to click on something, go off to some reference material and try to review that because whatever. And it was totally irrelevant and not used. Well, if you put things in context and you can point me to the right information when I need it, I'm going to read it. I can use it. I can actually do something with it. And I think that's where this kind of design and incorporating more physicians in the design of what they do day to day is critical. These systems were developed originally by programmers. Very few clinicians ever got involved with any of it. And they wound up creating something that they thought everyone would need. And all of a sudden they're finding out that doesn't work very well. Physicians get burned out when they have to retrain and reuse systems and in this world, we're going to run in as a practicing physician two or three or four different systems you may run across as you practice medicine across the spectrum. So anytime you can make that more usable, more acceptable, more helpful to the practice of medicine, the better off you're going to be. So um, we got a little bit of time left, Dave. If you could, perhaps you could sort of share a little bit of where you see this going um, you know, you've watched this through the course of innovation, development. You know, we've we've struggled in many respects to get this out, but now everybody's piling in. What is it that you think we're going to see coming out as a result of that change, that flip to sharing of information, but importantly, now making it accessible in a way that, you know, Jay and Tony talk about? Well, I, I think that we've taken the approach, and I think 
when people talk about burnout and accessibility information, our approach has always been that the most powerful computer in the room is in the clinician's brain. Uh, physicians, nurses, et cetera, are probably the most highly trained or among the most highly trained knowledge workers in the world. The systems they use do not support their right. thought processes. They, uh, they require them to stop, find stuff, et cetera. Probably, I don't know the number, uh, depending on whether you're talking about skeptics or not, probably 90 to 95 percent of the time when the physician or nurse walks into the room, uh, they can tell within uh, 30 seconds what they're dealing with, what information they need to act upon, et cetera. Oh, my God. But then they have to stop and find it in the <laughs> EHR. They know they've been trained to know this deeply trained on pattern recognition, and that's built on you know years of study, sleep deprivation, internship, residency, private practice, hospital practice, whatever. They get so good at it, and then all of a sudden, they got to turn to these systems that don't, don't give them the information to make the clinical decisions they need. They need clinical decision that supports their thought processes, not to start another thing to go find information. So, you know, we've always taken the approach, the EHR should not slow them down and not get in the way and give them the information they need when they need it. And they know the data points in their head. Uh, we've got to get these systems to deliver them at the point of need. And I think the industry is finally coming to that realization that these are hugely interconnected, complex relationships of clinical data to each other, not just simple transaction processing. And we're getting there. People are starting to realize that. Yeah, it's it's a, a an important inflection point because you're right. You don't find you know the head of uh, Merrill Lynch entering stock data into uh, the stock systems, but we ask physicians to do that, and you know they get the processed information. Here you are, I think, Medicomp sitting in that important intersection point to facilitate the extraction of that data and turning it into knowledge in a way that's going to be extraordinarily valuable going forward, which for me is exciting. I, I, I'm going to ask Jay, Tony, if you've got any sort of closing thoughts on, you know, what you're excited about in, in the coming, uh, you know, months. Okay. Thanks, Nick. Uh, I'll just make one final comment, and that is uh, that at HIMSS, if we if we had have been able to be there in person, you would have been able to see our uh, the, the nursing system that we've been working on and that we're, we're planning to launch. And uh, just as we make the uh, documentation tools and, and clinical decision-making support available to physicians now, uh, we're making that uh, available to support nurses and how they work so that we can really maximise the amount of time that nurses have to, to complete patient care and, and work with, uh, with patients rather than spending their time uh, searching through EHRs and doing repetitive documentation. Fantastic. And Jay, any final brief parting words? Well, interestingly, when I first started practicing, delivery of healthcare was physician-centric. Everything revolved around the physician. We've converted it to what it really should have been, which is patient-centric, and that means in all of its aspects, nurses, allied healthcare providers, physicians, PAs, whatever, that whole team taking care of patients, it's much more efficient, and if we can all share data, and I think the Cures Act is slowly inching that way, it'll make it better. Fantastic. Well, it just remains for me to uh, thank you all for joining me. Um, I want to thank our guests from uh, Medicomp Systems and, of course, our viewers uh, and listeners. Um, you can learn more about Medicomp Systems at uh, medicomp.com, that's M-E-D-I-C-O-M-P.com, and learn more about uh, me and my show, The Incrementalist, on the program page at healthcarenowradio.com. I'm Dr. Nick. I'm The Incrementalist. Thanks for joining me today. Do you have any better ideas, or have you found a small incremental change that's brought about a big improvement in your world? Let's continue the conversation on our hashtag, The Incrementalist, or share with me at Dr. Nick One on Twitter. You can find more information about the show on our program page at healthcarenowradio.com. And tune in next time to hear my discussions with leaders and innovators from around the globe who've revolutionized their space by using small incremental improvements to achieve their moonshot. I'm Dr. Nick, The Incrementalist, and I'm starting a revolution through evolution.